Hello and welcome to a brand new Arsblog Arscast right here on Arsblog.com. How are you? I hope you're well. I hope you're staying safe, staying healthy, staying sane, staying indoors, all the staying things that you have to do. I hope you're doing them and I hope that you and yours are feeling uh, as well as can be expected in this unprecedented time. Surreal set of circumstances. Trying times. Strange world we live in right now. And all the other countless email greetings that we are sending and receiving in these strange and unprecedented times. Look, we have a podcast for you all the same. Uh, A good show for you today. A little bit later on, I am going to be chatting to writer, journalist, documentary maker, podcast maker, and lots more besides... John Ronson, he will be on the line from New York. Uh, He is, of course, an Arsenal fan. So we'll be chatting to him about what's going on in his world and uh, a few bits and pieces besides. Um, And there is some football chat as well. The issue of player wages and cuts and refusals and rejections and all of those things have been playing out during the week. So we're going to get right into it. And first up, my guest uh, from Football London, or more uh, appropriately, No Football London, unfortunately, it's uh, James Bench. Hello, James. Hi, Andrew. How are you? I am all right. How are you getting on? How's how's things in the, the Bench household? Yeah, it's it's good. It's all right. I'm I'm staying with my partner's parents, um, which has has numerous upsides, including having my tea cooked for me, like I'm still a child. Lovely. There is a, there is a it, silver lining to every cloud. Yes, indeed, the, the, a thin silver lining. <laughs> very very thin and a massive huge grey cloud. But let's not go into the details. Um, let, let's talk a little bit about um, pay cuts and football and finance and all those things, because it is really the only thing that's been going on from an Arsenal point of view. And earlier in the week, the club announced that they had reached an agreement with with most of the players regarding a, a pay cut. And, you know, I've sort of been over the, the nuts and bolts and the rights and wrongs of billionaire owners and, and everything like that in, in previous discussions. Um, but just sort of from your understanding in terms of you know the the complexity of these negotiations and and how uh, they've reached this sort of uh, agreement with the majority of the players, despite the fact they've had to do it from distance. You know, uh, uh, Zoom meetings or whatever kind of meetings mm-hmm. people are having these days. You know, it has added a layer of complication to something that's already extremely complicated. So, just just uh, your 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 thoughts on how it's come together and and kind of how quickly it's come together. I think it, I think the remarkable thing is is how quickly it, it's come together, and I guess when we talk further, that that's almost what makes you question just how sustainable this agreement will be and whether it might have been rushed through. But I mean, it, as far as I understand, Hector Bellerin has kind of played the role of the the go between between the uh, the, the first team squad uh, and the um, and the Arsenal hierarchy. Obviously, Mikel Arteta has has done a lot of work there as well um, once the initial proposal was rejected. Um, but, you know, with a, a degree of persuasion from from Arteta in particular and mm. also, um, you know, Bellerin putting across the club's case very well, I would say, um, most of the, the squad uh, came around to that point of view. Um, I think, again, this may be something we can touch on in greater depth, but I think... The role that Arteta played in this, I, I, I find really interesting. And I both admire Mikel's ability to to get this deal together and to bring the squad mostly together when you you see something that, that was basically split down the middle. Mm. And now the majority of the squad back Arsenal's plan, that is good news at, at the very least. I think it's really admirable that Arteta can, can make a point to his squad so cogently, so effectively, and help them to understand... Um, the club's point of view. I also worry um, how I, if I were in the position of one of the younger players in this squad, um, might react if I get a phone call from my head coach uh, in which we discuss a pay cut. Mm. I have no reason to think that Arteta, in fact, I know Arteta would not have suggested that, you know, actions to do with a pay cut would have any impact on his selection when football gets back underway. But, you know, we all know that if your boss asks you to do something, and you say no, that can have ramifications mm. in terms of your relationship with your manager. And that's the thing I really worry about. 
Yeah, I mean, there's no suggestion, is there, that there were strong-arm tactics from Arsenal or from Mikel Arteta, or maybe there were, well, certainly not from Mikel Arteta, uh, (laughs) in the sense that, you know, he uh, has led by example in a way, and he's taken a significant cut to his wages, and I think he would have... He would have gone at this from a uh, the point of view of, look, if I'm doing it and I'm willing to do this, let's be together, let's be unified, let's mm. be harmonious and, and all those kind of things. But within the group, like you say, there are young players who may not feel they can stand up and say, well, no, I would prefer not to. Or, you know, mm. I've been given advice that I shouldn't take this because even still the PFA were telling players, don't take pay cuts. There are senior players who, uh, you know, one or two will come to uh, in a moment, obviously, who are being, uh, who are reluctant to take the pay cut. There are senior mm. players probably who are saying, well, look, you know, this summer, Arsenal were going to basically get rid of me. They were going to, you know, sell me and take as much money as they could get from me and move me on because I was of no use to them. Uh, you know, there are all sorts of issues at play in in discussions like this. And I think, you know, when you talk to any employee of any club or any business, you know, about their salary, about their wages, it's a it's a really delicate conversation to have yeah. uh, without it causing a problem. Like, you know, if you can see the company's point of view, the boss's point of view, and you kind of go along with it and you can see it's for the greater good, then fine. But not everybody is going to see things the same way. And and this week, Arsenal's players have become the first to agree. Now, nothing has been signed yet because there are still contractual things, but Arsenal players have, have become the first in the Premier League to agree pay cuts. Uh, and I think that does perhaps suggest that the message, certainly from uh, the point that Mikel Arteta got involved in things, has been pretty well received in general yeah i do think so I, I, but then i, t- I talked to i spoke to, to a number of um people that are, that are close to some of the players that that kind of get the feeling that this all kind of just went through with undue haste mm. and you know we're going to talk about mesa Urzel, but i mean i <laughs> it, it, it it's a really tough one to to get your head around because the reality is that the players should take pay cuts, but surely they should take them at the right moment and in the right way. And we, the, the, you know, it should be, this is the pay cut you're taking and that's final. And I think the fact that we know this offer is not necessarily the the last request the club will make. If the 2019, 20 season doesn't go ahead, we're, we're back to the drawing board. Mm. <laughs> that's what the, the, my my question for Arsenal would be why did you, why did you need to be the first? I mean Aston Villa or Bournemouth or you know teams that don't have a huge cash reserve that they're sitting on that don't have um, you know major financial means huge sponsorship deals. I can understand why there's real haste there. I have questions about why Arsenal needed to rush this through and whether it's been uh, well per- whether it's the perfect proposal the right proposal for this moment and for the the coming 12 months. And I guess in that instance, I share... uh, probably mess at Ozil's viewpoint on this. Sure. Well, I, let me play devil's advocate here, and it's not necessarily to stick up for the club or to, to say that they're doing the right thing, but I wonder if perhaps, like, okay, the cynical part of me says this is <laughs> this is great for KSE to save, uh, you know, yeah. a few million quid, and it helps them deal with a wage bill that they allowed to get out of control themselves. They're sort of correcting mm. their own mistakes, and it's opportunistic and everything else. At the same time, there is this sort of perceived wisdom, isn't there, that footballers get paid too much anyway, and they're an easy target, and I've spoken about that, and I'm very much on the side of footballers because I feel like, uh, you know, they they have been unfairly targeted throughout this thing. But maybe there's a sense or an idea that in order to kind of maintain a, a sense of unity, not simply within the club, but, you know, in the wider uh, context of Arsenal, like if if fans can see that players are taking a cut and feel like, you know, everyone's being affected by this thing. Like, you know, uh, John, who's just lost his job, and Mary, who's been furloughed, and, you know, whoever, you know, all the fans out there who are suffering uh, through this crisis, whether it's financially, whether it's um, mentally, physically, you know, their health, whatever it might be, but everyone's going to get impacted in a way you know, maybe they feel it's sort of important to demonstrate that uh, the players don't 
see themselves as above that, that in order to sort of maintain a, a, a relationship and a good relationship when all this is over, it's important for the players to say, look, we are doing our bit, even if we can rationalise ourselves about how much they pay in tax and their charitable endeavours, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Perhaps that might be part of the thinking. That's a really good point. Um, one I have to admit I hadn't considered. Um, and to be honest, I, re- I, I agree with that. And I think that comes back to, I think, one of the things that, that Arsenal have done so admirably uh, over recent weeks well, is everything in, in terms of the way they've dealt with this, um, you know, with the pandemic and the, the impact that's had on staff. Very early on, they came out and were saying, you know, we're going to make sure all our staff, including casual staff at the Emirates, are looked after. Now, we know there's issues with Delaware North and mm. um, potentially there's a, the long-term ramifications for the actions Delaware have taken. Um, but otherwise, I, I feel like Arsenal have acted in an exemplary way. And I think the way that not just Arsenal supporters, but the wider football community would expect Arsenal to react. I think that's really important because I think... The, there is a, a view that in the post Arsene Wenger era, Arsenal have lost touch with their values a bit, that they're not a club that really understands Arsenal that well. And I think past, the past few weeks have kind of proven that's wrong and that there are people there that really understand that this will be a period that defines what sort of football club you are. And mm-hmm. I don't think you could have asked for more from Arsenal than the way they've gone about, uh, they've gone about things. I think we can talk about Stan Kroenke um, we can talk about players and all that, but as a as an organisation as a whole, um, Arsenal have have done right by their community. And yeah, I totally see how the players just early on just going, "We are with you in that." I do think that can be a really powerful message and definitely something we should all think about. I hadn't thought about it, and it's a great point. Mm, okay, that's good. I have it's uh, nice sometimes to come up with a <laughs> good a good idea every now and again. Um, Look, there were issues, though, and there were uh, reports. I think uh, the initial vote um, was something like 50-50, and then it became a bit more uh, convincing in terms of the amount of players who were going to go through it. And David Ornstein was reporting for The Athletic that it was 25 out of 27. uh, And people were wondering, well, who are the two? And David was saying, well, look, it's not really any of our business. And then all of a sudden, everybody had the name of Mesut Ozil. The name of Mesut Ozil was out there. And the optics of that, I think, on a very surface level are not great because he is the highest earner at the club. Um, Mm. You know, there's certainly a... a, a, You know, I would be able to make the case that since he signed that big contract, Arsenal haven't got value for money for it in terms of what he's produced on the pitch, etc., etc. But... I listened to his agent. I don't know if you listened to the no, podcast. Yeah, yeah, with Raphael Honigstein. Um, you know, it's a very interesting conversation and it gives you a different perspective on, you know, what appears to be uh, or perhaps was portrayed as a slightly selfish decision. Mm. Um, you know, I, I, I tend to agree with you that that the more transparency and the more information available to players, the better. I think they deserve, you know, to to understand where their money is going, if the money is being cut, you know, if if the money is definitely going to ensure that jobs at the club are are, um, maintained, et cetera, et cetera. At the same time, though, you know, Mesut Ozil's agent, very clever guy, and you listen to him and he speaks very, very well, but he is, he is, um, how? What's the best way I can put this? He is truly an advocate of of Mesut Ozil. So yeah. you know, if Mesut Ozil was, uh, and I'm not saying he ever did this, if he threw a bag of puppies off a bridge into a flowing river, you know, he'd have a very good reason as to why he did that and why it was acceptable to do that. Uh, extreme example, I know, but this is an agent defending his client um, to the hilt, uh, and that's. I suppose something that's that's admirable in a way. Um, mm. You know, w- what is your take on on what um, Doctor Sogood said, and you know what Ozil uh, is thinking? Because I I thought maybe w- when his name came out, we know he's got this team of people who are there to sort of. Um, protect his his public image and, you know, to portray the very best of Mesut Ozil to everyone, which is absolutely fine. I thought we might hear something from the players' camp 
beyond that interview in in the last couple of days. So just your thoughts on on Ozil's rejection. Um, temper, you know, it's not an outright rejection. I think it's fair to say yeah. that that he he needs he's looking for more information. Blah blah blah. But just your thoughts on that situation overall. Uh, oh. Don't you find when you talk about um, Ozil, you always have to be very careful in how you phrase things. Um, yes. Yes. So I absolutely, uh, I I agree with Mesa Ozil's stance. That that would be my starting point. I think it's right to take time on this issue. I also think he's he's what he's done is quite powerful for um, his fellow teammates who might feel that they can't say no to the club. Ozil knows he knows where he stands with the club hierarchy because he's read both uh, public uh, private briefings and he's read quite public comments by mm. Mikel Arteta's predecessor that told him you are not really kind of that welcome around here anymore so my view on this is you know obviously he has not rejected that pay cut uh, as i understand it he'd be ready to take quite a significant deferral right away and not then take the pay cut off the table um, if that was required. You're right. Dr. Sogut's comments were very persuasive. Um, but it also kind of, the one thing it avoided is the fact that Arsenal need to have an idea of what their players are willing to accept to plan for the financial chasm that awaits them. And the pay cut that's going to, save Arsenal about 20 million. I think if you think like Arsenal do, that there won't be any football in the ground still 2021, mm. you're looking at, I, I mean, the, when they say that Arsenal's match day revenue is about 100 million, so say 75 million for, for nine months without home football. Plus so, refunds maybe that they have to make on this season. Yeah, exactly. There is there there is going to be a lot of money to be saved and the, the players alone can't do that. And I think having a clear commitment from the squad that we will help you right away. And, um, you know, we can, uh, that, that I see from Arsenal's perspective, I see the value in that. It is just that it's, it's messer, isn't it? And mm. it's, it's always such, the stakes feel so high. I think he, I think he should, he himself should by now have come out and, explained his reasoning because obviously what we have from Dr. Soga, I think it reflects Ozil's point of view as I understand it, but it isn't it, it isn't Messet's point of view officially. And I think we kind of need to hear that. Um just just because it's so easy then to for that void to be filled with other people's opinions. Yeah. You know, my opinion, your opinion, Piers Morgan's opinion. No. No, we don't need that. We really don't. No. But he will he, he he will see the void and he will throw himself headfirst into said void um, <laughs> with his opinion. The next one, yes, I mean that is true. <laughs> I, I, I want I want to hear from Messer, and you know he's we all every journalist will tell you he's not the easiest person to hear from. What really do you are you are you willing to commit to right now? The specifics, because again, mm. saying a significant deferral, how significant? You know, the, the talk is that the pay cut he might be willing to take further down the line is bigger than 12.5%. Well, it's easy to sort of say those things without making that firm commitment now. It's so complicated and convoluted and you keep going round and round in your head. But ultimately, I think we've got to try and see his point of view because I think it's too easy to just see £350,000 a week, what he won't give up any money right away and think, well, he's clearly the bad guy because for a lot for a lot of us in many industries around the world, we don't have a choice. These mm. pay cuts are just being presented as fact. Having said that, I do think it, it is encouraging that there is someone in that group um, who is willing to just sort of say, whoa, whoa, we, I won't be pressured here. Yeah. I mean, do you worry a little bit about what it might mean for... Uh, I've used the word unity and I think I've used the word harmony. I mean, do you... Look, there are two players who didn't take the pay cut and only one of them was named. And that is a little bit uh, worrying because if you can get the name of one, you can get the name of the other uh, if you Ooh. want uh, or if it's given to you, I guess. So, I mean, there it feels a bit like during this process, despite the fact there's been um, a pretty okay outcome overall, 
both sides have kind of used the media at times to present their side of the case. And, uh, you know, I thought the, you know, the bit in the, the Arsenal statement about how the executives have had earlier that yes. month, you know, decided to take a, a pay cut uh, and then they they um, sign off the statement with the, the club motto, which, of course, is victory through harmony. You know, uh, it just feels like maybe there's a danger that, that, that things, when it all comes out in the wash, don't necessarily uh, bring everybody together as, as we might like. Oh yeah, I, re- I really worry about that, um, and I think that th- I get the feeling it's kind of all on Arteta now to to bring them all together, because I mean, look, you know, it's only a fortnight ago that the players were rejecting that. You know, not all of them, but a lot of players were were rejecting that pay cut offer and and, and feeling quite uncomfortable with the way that the the hierarchy and you know Husfami and Raul Sanye had, had presented it to mm. them. That you know it had been. The, 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 there is still, a, I think, a degree of uncomfortableness at the way in which these talks have been carried out. I think there's a sense that Hector Bellerin was put in a really awkward position. Yeah. Um, and you know, the, I, I, I do. I, I worry that the this is going to build a gap, perhaps not between Arteta and his squad, but between the the football executive um, and and the first team because. It the, the, it had the, the negotiations were they weren't like acrimonious or anything, but they were uncomfortable and mm. I think some people might feel like you put me in quite an uncomfortable position and that may well be reflected in in contract negotiations down the line um, and there are quite a few important ones of them that need doing this summer. Mm. I mean the other thing to bear in mind uh, and I think you sort of alluded to this is the fact that while it feels like half a lifetime since football stopped it's only six weeks Mm. and after six weeks uh during which arsenal's revenue hit has been pretty minor you know in in broad terms Mm -hmm. because there's still the potential to get the tv money there's still the potential for games you know to go on um and you know you get all that kind of revenue that 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 comes in once the games are broadcast etc etc but this is what's happening after six weeks and this is a club with big cash reserves, with a billionaire owner, um, and that's not to belabor this particular point. But if after six weeks this is what's happening, what happens if you know we're in August or September or later this year? Um, we're going to have to go through something like this again, or something like this is going to have to be implemented. Maybe it goes out of the negotiation phase, and then you know, like you mentioned earlier, it becomes a fact. This is what we have to do, like it or lump it. Um, And maybe it won't be quite as uh, agreeable to everybody to take these cuts. And the wider issue, of course, is that if if Arsenal, as one of the richest clubs in the world, you know, relatively speaking, I know that there are clubs who are far more wealthy than we are, but in the grand scheme of things, Arsenal are one of the richest football clubs in the world. What does it say for the sport uh, in general, beyond the Premier League, in the Championship, in League One, in League Two, in, in smaller leagues across Europe, et cetera, et cetera, that if this is the impact it's having on us, it's going to be even worse across the board. Yeah, I, I this is the, the bit that I really, you know, as a, as a football fan and also as a football journalist, I, I worry a lot about what the what the, the game will look like when we come out of this. I can't see every single club uh, in you know, in League One and Two, making it through this, in, in, and coming back out of it in some state of normality, and the same in other leagues around um, Europe, because the money is so overwhelmingly skewed towards not even the Premier League, the top six teams in the Premier League. Mm. Arsenal's revenue is double that of West Ham, who are the seventh richest. If Arsenal are struggling, which they would appear to be suggesting they are, then how any team that doesn't have ninety million pounds from the you know, ninety million from the Premier League as a starting point every year, how they cope, I honestly don't know. I don't I mean you you think about government intervention, but then why is football any more deserving of that than the arts, than the you know sure. restaurants and pubs and and I just I, I don't know. I don't think anyone really knows yet. 
because does just playing behind closed doors does that help uh, in the lower leagues from what I've read not really I don't know again there's so much that I just I, I wish I could answer but mm. you, you see what's going on at Arsenal and you do think God if they if they're already this worried about it what on earth does it mean for Boreham Wood mm. well look you know hopefully football can find a way to uh, you know support the clubs because uh, they are obviously the integral part of the game um, but you know the way things are going it's hard not to be worried about the futures of, of some of them uh, whether UEFA or FIFA have some kind of fund that could um, help prop them up we, we don't know and whether governments can help we don't know but we will see um, just moving on from, from that side of things there was a story during the week James about uh how UEFA might be looking at using uh, the coefficients to decide European places, and there was some general hilarity on the on the Arsenal Twitter <laughs> because uh, I think our our coefficient would have seen us fourth in the Premier League terms, and therefore we would qualify for the Champions League. You know, as and when there might be Champions League again. Uh, this afternoon, UEFA have uh, accepted a proposal from the Spanish. Uh, FA, which sort of suggests that uh, the fairest way to do things if the leagues are cancelled is to use the final positions or the positions that the clubs are in right now, which obviously would have some consequences for Arsenal. Bastards. Absolute <laughs> bastards. I was, really, I was really hyped for that for about three seconds and then you go, oh no, they're definitely not going to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like you've got to got to finish the season. I, I, it's not beyond Arsenal to get back in the the Europa League. I mean, no. If it does carry on, there's the FA Cup as well. I think you've always got the sense that like Ars- Arsenal under Arteta, there was quite a lot of commitment to getting that trophy. Obviously, he knows how valuable an FA Cup win can be in that building momentum in the squad. Um, it would have been massively unfair on. Tottenham and Chelsea and Leicester and like I would have loved it I'd absolutely <laughs> have been like you know when all my colleagues are doing Thursday nights in Baku and I'm at the Bernabeu I would have been unfair <laughs> I'm glad you're uh, glad you were thinking about the wider football ramifications of this oh James. yeah of course <laughs> I mean I do I, I mean it seems like a lot of leagues will be having to to fall back on 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 this and you know, you wonder if it might also be the case for 2020, 21. Um, if there's a, a second wave next winter, um, we may well kind of see the same thing. It's just going to have to be so much flexibility and fluidity built into everyone's plans. Doesn't help that there's a weird mid-season World Cup to to consider. But like, yeah, it would have been absolute nonsense if Arsenal had gone into the Champions League. That yeah, way. And I mean, presumably it would have been the year they'd win it. Yeah, <laughs> that would be even more funny. Uh, and they get their five hundred thousand uh, pound bonus that the club have incentivized oh. them with. It will be all down to that. Oh man, spend that! I did, if if Arsenal did ever win the Champions League, surely that five hundred thousand pound bonus is nothing compared to the number of pints that every single one of that squad will be bought on for the rest of their life. For sure. Whenever someone sees them in the pub. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that was a, that was a real, I think, I, I think that gesture was really uh, not one that the um, squad considered all that serious as, a, as an option. You surprise me. You surprise yeah. me. Yeah. Real shock. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Look at that. Well, come on, lads. Let's work harder towards Champions <laughs> League glory. I mean, the other thing is, of course, is that even if domestic football gets going again, you know, it might be some time before uh, widespread international or, or or national, you know, country to country travel is is open again. Um, you know, because of everything that's going on, it might be a case that that uh, it takes a while for that to get going. So there may not be, maybe football's a special case. You know, they can all have their private jets and come in and out and, and do that kind of stuff. But anyway, we'll see. We'll look forward to uh, some Champions League glory as and when it comes. And we can thank uh, Raul Sanyehi and his executive team for making sure the players are up for the Champions League with their, nice. with their bonuses. Uh, James, stay well, stay safe, and good to talk to you. Thanks for having me on. Thank you to James. You can follow him on Twitter at James Benj. That is at James Benj. Okay, now on the Arsecast, I'm delighted to welcome back to the show somebody who was on before, but it was quite some time ago. March 2014 was when I sat down in a hotel room with John Ronson. Hello, John. It doesn't seem like that long ago, does it? 
It does not, Andrew. It doesn't, but um, it doesn't. But you know what it's like when someone said about getting older that getting getting older is like driving uh, from central London to Heathrow. Uh, in the the first part of the journey um, is very very slow. <laughs> everything seems to take forever, and then suddenly everything just speeds up massively, and you're on the M4 going. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god or in terms of this metaphor uh, old age and death yeah okay well you know I was just thinking about the airport they have a nice new terminal in Heathrow Terminal 2 there is very nice the Dublin to London flight is is you know it's all very swish of course none of us are going to be seeing any airports uh, for a while it, no. it doesn't seem like so how are you how are you coping you're in you're in New York uh, yeah, I'm, I'm in upstate New York. We've we've moved upstate about a year ago, and so I am there. So I'm in a little village um, about two hours north of New York City. So, you know, as as sitting out waiting for the plague to end locations go, mm. it's, I've got to say this is a pretty privileged one. We've got a garden. We've got dogs. We've got nice neighbors within the space of like one song of jogging. Um, I'm in <laughs> I'm in the, the wilderness, so wow. where, where there's just country lanes. So um, I, you know, I, I feel very fortunate. What about you? I'm okay. I'm okay. You know, we're just sort of sitting here. We've got a garden, so we're quite lucky in that regard. We're we're geographically restricted at the moment. We can't go more than two kilometers from the house. Unless what you're doing, do does your phone sign and signal like, like does they, an alarm go off? They have police checkpoints around. You know, I've been stopped more than once because my dad, who's 83, lives more than two kilometres away. So I'm sort of going up and down to his house and helping him with groceries and things like that because he's not supposed to go out because they're doing this cocooning. Do they call it that over there? No, well, we don't have it. Uh, yeah, oh yeah, of course. It's it's a bit um, crazy. It's. Look, I mean, it's easy for me to say here in a little village in upstate New York, but I do look at what's happening in 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 Britain and Ireland slightly slightly baffled, um, because I, I've I, you know I've seen f- video of uh, people who are socially distancing. They're like on their own in a park, miles from anybody, and then the police turn up. Mm. And, yell at them through megaphones to go home. And that just feels unnecessary. Someone tweeted me the other day that, you know, this pandemic is turning neighbours into police and police into the army. Uh, then again, if it's the army who are stopping you, uh, then what, what have they turned into? I guess yeah. they've just stayed with the army. Uh, <laughs> the mega so- army, I don't know. I mean, look, we, we haven't we haven't quite had that level of stuff here. I have seen one or two of those videos as well. But here, you know, you say to the police, I'm going up to help my elderly dad with his groceries. And they're like, uh, okay, no problem. Have a good day. Thank you very much. Although they did, uh, they did put someone in jail here, uh, a man who drove from Derry in the north uh, to Kerry in the, in the south uh, to buy two puppies. And he was told to go home and he didn't. And apparently they put him in jail for that, which seems a little harsh, even if he was breaking the rules. Yeah, it seems harsh. I, I, like, oh, are you, look, I've got my own sort of, you know, I've only got I've only got New York rules to go on. Mm. Uh, New York rules, uh, you know, there's none of those restrictions. As, as long as you stay, you know, as long as you do all the sensible things that we've been told to do, you know, there's no restriction on how long you can be outside for or, mm. or anything like that. And, and it seems fine. And I'm saying this as somebody who, you know, who's who, who's not flouting a single rule and gets very, you know, um, pissed off at people who do. But it seems it seems to me that in Britain and Ireland that, that everyone's going a little bit too draconian. Well, I mean, you should see what, what's happening in Spain and Italy and France and things like that, where you have to have, like, you have to fill in a form if you're going to the grocery store. You have to yeah. d- download and fill out a form. My daughter lives in Barcelona, and she has barely been out of her apartment in the last five or six weeks. You know, again, the only reason you're allowed out is to go grocery shopping or to, you know, go to the pharmacy or pick up medical supplies and and things like that. So, you know, there's a huge difference, certainly a huge difference in this part of the world, you know, how it's being uh, or how they're trying to manage it, certainly in comparison to what's going on over there. And certainly in, you know, in New York City, it's it's obviously a very different thing, um, perhaps, to New York State. 
my son's in New York City, and I don't think that he's being sort of policed on, mm. on the occasions that he goes outside. And, and you know, I, I'm caveating all of this by saying I'm, you know, I, I 100% support all the social distancing and the quarantining and so on. But it just feels like, you know, certain cultures are just take, taking it a little bit too far, thus, you know, just acting a little bit more authoritarian than they have to. Yeah. Tell me. The forms that your daughter has to fill out, because we have to fill out forms here, but they're not like permission forms, they're order forms. You know, you go online, you choose what you want from the grocery store, um, and then you pick it up curbside. Is, is that what you're talking about, or is it like kind of different forms? I think this is in France, and I only know anecdotally from people who've said they have to fill out a form to go out on the street to go to the supermarket. So you hand in the form, and, you know, if someone asks you for it, this is why you're you're out and about. Um, I, I, you know, I think you, you can only go a very short distance from your home. You're allowed to walk your dog in Spain, for example, but you're only allowed to go a very short distance with the dogs, uh, which is a real shame for dogs. But, you know, they're, they're, they're cracking down on it in a, in a big way. I suppose the danger is, isn't there, that when, when things get put in place, they're kind of hard to undo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, you know, we're wanting you to say those stories. I mean, we are so lucky. You know, we can we can take our dogs to like the local state parks or you know the sort of gardens of country houses. Mm. Uh, as I say, as long as you're socially distanced and as long as you wear a mask, if you're somewhere where you you know you're going to be pretty close to other people, uh, there's just there's no problem. And I don't. And as you know, I, I think of myself as like a sort of logical person, and it feels to me like those. Restrictions are the, are the right ones, but all that stuff that you just said to me just seems a little, I don't know, a little too much, Andrew. Yeah, I mean, it's like when, when something happens and you have to do a new thing before you get on an airplane, you know, like uh, like the yeah. shoe guy. After the shoe guy, we all, we all had to take our shoes off, even though that was just one yeah. guy. You know that when uh, before they closed down all the airplanes... Um, they sort of they just got rid of that you know that rule about you can only have a certain amount of liquid mm. on your plate uh, for a little while they just got rid of it because they wanted people to be able to have big bottles of hand sanitizers so they could like wash down you know they could sanitize their tray tables and stuff so they just wow. got rid of that rule and it did make me think well and then they're letting like prisoners who've committed non-violent acts go home and it does make you think Chris what other you know completely arbitrary restrictions that we've been living off we've been living under for so many years ah, yeah. um, don't actually matter because they just got rid of them as soon as the crisis started. Well, I mean, it's a sort of like, well, we have no money for the health service whatsoever. There's absolutely no money. There's no budget for it. We can't do anything. And over here in Ireland, it was all of a sudden, it was like, oh, we're taking over all the private hospitals and we're finding money from, you know, everywhere to get, you know, as much treatment and as much, you know, and it's sort of like, well, hang on a minute. You know, yeah, if, if you yeah. can do it now... Why couldn't you do that before? You know, of course, well, the political um, the political machinations of things like that are, are obviously the driving force. But, you know, the idea that this is impossible, we cannot possibly do this. We cannot, let's say, uh, again, going back to Spain, I, I read a report last week. They were, they were considering the implementation of universal basic income, something like that. You know, mm -hmm. things that people say, these are impossible. We cannot do them. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, well, actually, you know. Yeah, and, and these are sort of, you know, this is like profound um, when you think about it. Mm. Because, you know, as somebody tweeted me the other day, if, if the economy collapses because people have to stay at home, um, maybe that shows that there's something wrong with the economy. Uh, because the other sort of weird thing that's happening is that I think a lot of people, I think quite a lot of people, both those who've had the virus, but also those who are just quarantining, are looking at the world in a new way. Um, Brooke Baldwin, who's a CNN presenter over here, gave an interview the other day where you know she had the she had the virus pretty badly, and mm. she said she was like lying in bed, shivering, and thinking, "Why have I spent my life working so hard when I should have like gone to the beach, you know, at least a bit?" <laughs> um, I think a lot of people are thinking that. A lot of people are thinking, "I'm actually quite enjoying." Um, I, I think particularly introverts, I think, who are suddenly have got permission to do all the things that they want to do rather than it being sort of frowned upon. You know, whenever I don't want to go to parties, 
um, it's kind of frowned upon. It's like sort of considered a bit of a deficiency, but obviously no longer. Now it's considered heroic, like a heroic <laughs> sacrifice. <laughs> and, um, um, it, it does all of this does make me wonder what what the what the legacy of of this is going to be. It does feel like it's going to have a profound effect on society in in like myriad ways because obviously we've talked about the restrictions and whether they'll all be lifted, you know, people who have got a new perspective on life, people who are going to be just badly affected by it, whether that's financially, they lose their jobs, the impact that it might have on them, the economy that we talk about, and of course, the people who've become sick, the people who've died, the people who've lost people, uh, you know, and, and, you know, it's a strange time it's never obviously a pleasant thing to lose somebody but at the moment there are people whether they're dying from the virus or from other things you know the sort of structures that we have in place as a society to cope with them like funerals like get togethers like families coming together at a time of grief those things aren't happening either and I do feel like down the line there's going to be a sort of ripple effect uh, across societies in terms of how this thing is, is played out and then there's going to be other people with vested interests to try and put the world back to how it was before the virus started, mm. who are then presumably going to be, um, uh, you know, flexing their muscles to try and put the old systems back in place. And I wonder whether there's going to be opposition to it. I mean, there certainly was after the Black Death. Uh, you know, after the Black Death, um, society became a lot more egalitarian because the serfs, I know this because I've been watching the great courses plus about the black death. Okay. Um, the <laughs> Some serfs, cheery uh, watching at this time. Yeah. Oh, well, I thought, well, I might as well learn about other plagues um, <laughs> in the downtime. And um, yeah, because so many, you know, serfs died, then the surviving serfs had a lot more power. They could like, they could demand more money. And so serfs started moving into landowners' houses and society became more egalitarian. It'd be really interesting to see whether any of that's going to happen. Yeah. I mean, the idea that it would all just go back to what we considered normal before. I mean, you, you, there are times when you think, God, I'd, I wish it was back to normal. I wish it was just back to normal. I could go out on a Friday night. I could go to the pub and have a pint and see my friends and, you know, just go to the shop or just whatever. Just go into town and just mingle around and just be around people. Like one of the things I like to do most in the world is, is be in a big city and just sit somewhere and people watch uh, and just watch yeah. people go by you know, sit at a bar outside and just watch people go up and down the street. You know, it's a it's a fascinating way to, to spend some time uh, without being completely voyeuristic about it. It's just really interesting to see the, the, the size and breadth and shape of humanity pass you by in the space of half an hour or an hour on a city street. And then there's other times you're thinking, well, you know, when normal was normal, there was a lot of shit that wasn't great. And maybe this would be a good opportunity to try and fix at least some of it. Yeah, yeah. I I am in agreement with everything that you just said, including the part about sitting there, people watching. Mm. Yeah, I'm sort of thinking, what, what do I really miss? Um, I miss um, I miss having I, probably about once every two or three weeks in the last sort of several years, I've been, uh, I, I meet uh, Mae Piggins for dinner. Um, your, oh, yeah. And because um, she moved to New York around the same time that that I did, and I miss that. I miss having my dinners with Maeve. It, it is, yeah. It's just those small little social interactions that you're used to, and um, yeah, it doesn't. Well, we don't know when we're going to get them back. Um, yeah. well, there's, there's other weird new forced conversations though that I don't like um you know a lot of people want to have zooms with me and you know <laughs> lots of people I barely know have like got back in touch <laughs> see that's 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 the difficulty because everyone knows you're at home yeah I know it's a bit that's a bit annoying uh, our local shop so we have to fill out a grocery form so right. you, you decide um you know what you want and then you fill it out online and then they phone you and ask for clarification so I'll tell you the real pitfall of that is yogurt because on the order form <laughs> it just says yogurt so you tick it and then they phone you up and go through you know every um every flavor every, every flavor and every brand and it, that really goes on a long time I could do without that What's your what's your uh, what's your flavor of choice? 
Well, I mean, it varies a lot. I went to the Kripani, um I, It's easier for me because I like all yogurts. It's easier for me to tell you the yogurts I don't like. Um, maple, because uh, it's too subtle. Mm. I tweeted that and somebody tweeted me back to say that they work in yogurts. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm right. They have big problems with maple. <laughs> well, I don't think you can get that here. Say that again. I, I, I don't think you can get maple yogurt here. Really? No. Well, it's, I, I presume it's uh, Canadian. Um, mm. Anyway, you're not missing anything because it's too subtle. Sure. Uh, it's hard to get a strong maple flavor in yogurt for some sort of physics reason. I don't like maple. I don't like passion fruit um, or papaya. But pretty much everything else I, I enjoy. Okay. Well, there's a wide variety out there for you uh, for you to choose yeah. from. So, I mean... Oh, the- God, I- Oh, I know. It's it's real boon times for yogurt flavors. Or maybe it was always like that, but I've only just noticed because it's become like a new hobby of mine. Maybe so. It could be like beer, you know, the, all of us, there was beer and then there was craft beer. So maybe this is craft yogurt. Who knows? Yeah. You know. <laughs> So I mean, you're uh, you're avoiding the, uh, the the Zoom things as much as possible. Obviously, I've taken advantage of the fact that you know, as a podcaster, it's a glorious time to try and get people to do podcasts because, like I said, you know, you know, everybody's going to be home. You know, you can't do the thing. I'm away. I'm traveling. Can't answer this email. Well, you've got nothing else to do but but answer emails. Um, has any part of that felt a little bit oppressive? This this sort of idea that everyone knows where everyone else is all the time slightly I've, I've had a few requests from um like festivals um that obviously have had to cancel so they're doing like online festivals and wanted me to take part in them mm. but I, and i got one this morning but i was a little grumpy about it because it was a festival that had actually never invited me in person <laughs> um so i'm like um i um i won't say which one because i don't want to like you know Sure. Uh, showing them, but um, but I did think, oh, you know, now now you fucking you know want me to talk, but you know why didn't you ever sort of offer me five grand to come and talk when back in the days when you know you'd get paid to talk at festivals? Yeah. Um, so I don't know. Yeah, how, I was a bit about that. How oh, how is um how is the work situation anyway? You know, as um. Obviously, as a writer, there's a lot you can do from home, and um, you know you, you can sit down at your computer and, and write away as as many of us do. But you know, a lot of your work involves being around other yeah, people, or at least observing yeah. other people, you know, um, from the sidelines. So, uh, yes. has well, it had a big effect? I do, yeah, I mean, I can't do that anymore. Well, for now, mm. um, fortunately. What what I was going to be doing around this time was writing a story for a screenplay. So I've been commissioned to write a, a screenplay, um, and I was always going to be spending these couple of months working on that, which which is you know obviously staying at home. I mean there is research, but it's research you could do online as opposed to going off and, and meeting people. So fortunately for me, um, I'm I'm you know waking up every morning with something productive to do this this story. But in about three weeks' time, the story is going to be finished and delivered, and you know then I'm going to have to move on to thinking about a new book. But you're right; like I, I'm not a polemicist. I'm not somebody who can sit there and and think in a vacuum. I have to go off and meet people and you know have adventures. And yeah. I don't quite know how I'm going to adapt to that when it comes to writing a new book. Uh, yeah, it's going to be. It's going to be a challenge, depending on you know what the state of play is. I know. I, I think I tweeted at you this before, and you know, I, I would love a, an in-depth look at people who film themselves trying to do a trick or a, an impressive stunt and fail, and they send these videos. The only way these fail army, you know, the fail videos on YouTube, people falling over, hurting themselves. The only way they can get them is for that person to have sent it in themselves. So they're trying to do a pull up in a door and the door falls or they land on their face doing a skateboard thing and they're the only person there. They're filming it with their own camera and and they're still willing to send it into fail army. Uh, There must be something about the psychology of people who are happy to do that. Because if I was, I'd like, I'd just sort of, well, I'll try it again, try it again until such time as I get it. And I'm not going to share the bits where I like smash myself in the nose. But people are out there happy to do it. 
Yeah. Oh, well, I'm glad it's consensual that they've done it themselves. They put it up themselves because quite often, like somebody will tweet, you know, this is the funniest video ever. Watch to the end. Mm. So, ooh, and I watch to the end. And it's just somebody getting like quite badly hurt. And I don't want to see that. It's like a snuff. It's like a snuff movie. <laughs> <laughs> So quite often I've been like, you know, I don't want to see people getting hurt. Um, so I'm so I'm glad at least that they posted it themselves. Well, I'm guessing that's what's happening. I don't mind. You see, I don't mind watching a few people get hurt, you know, once it's not too badly, you know, people doing skateboard things and things like that. Any any video where somebody falls for any great distance before landing makes my stomach flip, though, and I have to pause it for a minute. Oh well, you have you've you've just uh, pinpointed one of my bugbears, which is uh, Instagram videos of sky of skydivers where the video cuts out before the parachute opens. Oh wow! Well, I did. Is that a thing? I, yeah. Well, I don't think they'd like doing it deliberately. I think they probably think you know well, that, that's the best bit, so right. we don't we don't need to show the part where the parachute opens, and we just sort of you know fall gently down. But I'm think I'm watching it, and it's like. I don't know. There's something anxiety inducing about it. You're seeing them plummet. I, I want to see the. I want to make. Sh- I want to make sure they're okay. And, and and I want to see the parachute open. You don't trust. <laughs> well, or your mind trigger- goes. Your mind goes to the worst place. Yeah. Well. Yeah. <laughs> well, it does trigger some anxiety in me. Oh man, um, it does. Yeah. Um. So uh, podcasts, have you any more planned? Because obviously you've done a few in in the last uh, number of years. There was the butterfly effect in the last days of August, which were based around the um, the world of pornography and the impact that it's had on society and some certain individuals, mm-hmm. um, which were really excellent and very well received. Um, you know, have you plans for another one? I don't necessarily mean in the, in that specific area, but but anything mm-hmm. else? Yeah, I, in fact, I was I was halfway through making a new one um, when when all of this happened. So so we've put it on hold. Um, so I hope we were about to go off and meet like a really important figure who we've been spending like a year, a really important figure in terms of the narrative of the story. Mm. Who we've been spending about a year trying to get, and and we were literally going to go and see the woman on like the Wednesday and about four days. Four days before, I kind of pulled the plug on it. It was it was just before the lockdown, right. and so I pulled the plug on the, on the travel, and that basically meant we had to put the whole show on hiatus. Um, so that's where we are with that. I'm, I'm hoping that you know once everything opens up a bit, we can go and see her and resume the story. It's a good story. I can't I can't tell you what it is because uh, it's I haven't told anyone. But okay. But, um, but you know we need this this woman to make the story work. So I just really hope that um, I really hope it happens. Okay. Well, fingers crossed. It won't take too long. And you know, podcasts uh, as a guest, apart from this one, uh, you've uh, you've done the first episode of a new podcast with with Louis Theroux, which is bound to be interesting. Yeah, it was good. We talked for about um, we talked for about two and a half hours, and it's been cut down to an hour. So, so the honest answer is, um, you know, there's a really great hour in there, but you know, I'm, I'm not editing it, and um, you know, I, I don't think Louis is editing it. I think they've got an editor who I talk to and seem like a really great person. But I suppose my point is, is that there's a great hour in there. So I hope that's <laughs> that's what it is. Is the great hour. Um, I will say it's going to go out in a couple of days. I think in about sort of four or five days. Okay. Uh, it was nice. It was really nice to. I, I've asked Louis maybe twice. I think I've asked Louis three times to to do something with me, and twice he said yes, and once he said no. Um, and and this is the first time he's asked me to do something with him. So uh, of course I said yes. Okay. Well, that's- but it's nice. it's nice to talk to Louis at a time when I don't think there really is much rivalry between us anymore. Um, Did- we both sort of matured our way out of those sort of destructive thought spirals where we were like comparing our careers to the other and so oh, on. Wow. Was, um, was that a thing? Was that oh, that's in the nineties for me? Yeah, totally. Wow. Totally. I, it was because I was like riding high. Um, think of it as like how the Pixies must have felt when Nirvana got big. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but 
but, but, but literally the 90s. I mean, what, what really cured me of, of those negative feelings was bringing out the book then. Um, mm. Because, you know, it did well and, and it was a book. It wasn't a documentary. So it felt like... It felt like we were sort of going in slightly different directions, and and Louis was Louis was like really good on TV, and I was really good at writing, and we didn't have to be competitive with each other anymore. Okay, um, is that something but, you talk about in the in the episode? A bit, yeah. I sort of wish I I sort of we did talk about it, yes. And and after the um, interview was over, I said to them um, that I think that stuff's the most interesting stuff, and I hope that they you know use it. So we'll see. That's interesting. You know, the the sort of uh, operating in the same sphere, you know, of this kind of storytelling and looking beneath the surface or scratching beneath the surface of, of I don't know, I don't want to say normal human life, but, you know, finding stories which are somewhat extraordinary, I think you would say, but then yeah. branching out and, and doing it in two different mediums or different ways anyway. Yeah, I mean, it was kind of extraordinary that we, the two of us have done the same, um, you know, areas and also quite often the same individuals um, so frequently. It's happened so frequently, um, 10 times or even more. Right. Uh, we've ended up doing the same thing. Um, I mean, just recently, we both had, we both shared a stage with Megan Phelps Roper from the Westboro Baptist Church. I mean, oh, that's yeah. our sort of niche you know, our similarities are, um, you know, one time I was, I'm sorry for all the pings, by the way, that's emails coming through, but I don't know how to silence them. Um, but yeah, there was one time when, uh, this is years ago, this is probably about 97. Um, I was in Montana. I was driving from, from, um, uh, Idaho to Montana. It was like, it was about an eight hour drive to this tiny white separatist community, uh, called Almost Heaven in uh, Montana. And it took us like literally eight hours to drive. And we finally got there, pulled up and wound down the window. And I sort of said, hi, I'm looking for. Um, and the guy said, oh, a Brit. We had another Brit here last week. I don't know if you know him. He's called Louis Thoreau. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> and my cameraman just burst out laughing. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, what can you do? There are strange stories everywhere, but I guess when you follow certain paths, you're going to end up in more or less uh, the, yeah. the same the same locations. Okay, well, we look forward to that. The, the, I think the Louis podcast is called Grounded. Mm -hmm. um, so it via, was, I, I think there was a great... There was a great hour in there, so hopefully, you know, hopefully people really like it's it. It's sort of an unusual way to do it, isn't it? Because, you know, if you're doing the hour interview podcast, it's usually an hour of an interview, uh, and that's kind of it. And, and what it is, it is. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm quite happy, though. I mean, I, I love editing. Like, editing is my, my favorite part of the process, so I'm, I'm fine. Like, these kind of long-form, unedited conversations like we're having now is, is good, but my real heart is with is with edited stuff so right so i've got no problem with um you know them, them editing that conversation down that's yeah i you know for me because the the conversations usually are about football and therefore pretty ephemeral you know they don't last so there's no yeah. real need to to go over and edit a conversation about football but um yeah, yeah look the only time i edit is if there's something wrong with the uh with the the sound or some little clicks and beeps and things like that even i'm not referring to your uh, email noise here by the way yeah. um a couple of weeks ago on on twitter somebody uh, tweeted at both of us uh and they wanted to know what you thought of tiger king so have you finished watching tiger king and w what I, did you I, think I, of that um i had a lot kind of kind of quite a lot of thoughts about it my first thought is that i think um and you know what like i'm no this is not a hill that i'm gonna die on <laughs> but i had a sort of uh, vague idea that carol baskin had been treated and uh, treated poorly in the documentary right. and that when you really think about it she's not as bad as the other as the other people in, in the documentary yet she was portrayed and you know what I, I you know i'm gonna probably be um uh criticized for saying this but i i think she was maybe p p portrayed in a somewhat misogynistic fashion i mean one of the very first things that happen when you see her 
is you, you, the director is like in the car and he sort of says to the cameraman something like, oh, she's dressed perfectly, you know, meaning mm. that she's dressed sort of absurdly. And it, it's, that, that was a moment when I thought they really played their hand. You know, it was kind of sneering. Um, so I didn't like, I didn't like that. I do think that they found an incredible story and I found the whole documentary, you know, incredibly entertaining. But but it was kind of, it, you know, it, it was hierarchical. You know, the director mm. certainly considered himself higher above the, the people that he was filming. And I, and I never loved that. It was certainly an amazing achievement to find quite so many appalling people. Uh, and put and them was, all together. I, I mean, psychologically, it was incredible. I mean, you know, I, I, I'm really against diagnosing people as psychopaths from afar. Um, but even though you're asked to do that all the time because of the book that you wrote, yeah, <laughs> uh, there's certainly some moments. I mean, one of the big things in the psychopath checklist is is predators and prey. It's like a running theme in psychopathy literature that psychopaths see themselves as predators. Or they see the world in terms of predators and prey, and it would be foolish not to exploit weaknesses in others. Uh, that's a direct quote from the Psychopath Checklist. Mm. Uh, and I met, when I was writing the Psychopath Test, I met various people who presumably would score higher in the Psychopath Checklist who had massive um, uh, sculpture gardens filled with sculptures of predatory animals. Uh, so the fact... So I think the whole predators and prey thing and this sort of fetishization of predatory animals probably points to some of the participants of the show. Maybe not um, uh, your main guy whose name suddenly eluded me. Joe Exotic. Uh, yeah, Joe Exotic. Maybe not him, but some of the others is mm. probably scoring high on the psychopath checklist. I say not him because one real telltale sign about psychopaths is a, is a kind of, it's what's called a sort of shallow affect, like an inability to experience a range of emotions. And you get the sense that there's just not really very much going on under the surface. But my feeling, I mean, this is total armchair bullshit, mm. but, my, but my armchair bullshit feeling is that there, there was a lot going on under the surface with, with Joe, which would pretty much discount him from being a psychopath, as far as I understand the literature. Mm, I, saw, I saw a headline the other day about how, uh, do you know American Horror Story? You know that TV series? Yeah. The I've guy, never watched it, but I know. I know yeah, it. I think the guy's called Ryan Murphy, um, uh, and he's, he's apparently in talks to produce a, a film about the Tiger King starring Rob Lowe as Joe Exotic. So there's oh, really? some casting for you, yeah. Wow. Well, Will Ferrell should play um, your man. Uh, who's what's the name? Oh, of the other Doc a Doc Antle. Yeah, yeah. Will Ferrell should play him. And uh, Matthew McConaughey, no legs. Matthew McConaughey, he's straight in there. That guy. <laughs> yeah, and of course Lisa Kudrow should play Carl Baskin. Oh God, that's brilliant casting. All right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, look, before I let you go, uh, everyone is at home and everyone's looking for things to do or read or listen or watch. So can I maybe press you for a couple of recommendations that you might give to people that can help them pass the time over this weekend or the week to come? Sure. Well, the recommendations I'll give are things that, you know, we've been doing the last couple of weeks. Um, and and the, honestly, I think most of the people listening to this will already know most of these things. Okay. Um, season three of Ozark, I thought was was incredibly good uh, particularly Julia Garner who plays Ruth Langmore she's she's like an inc uh, she's incredible have you have you watched those uh, I watched the first season and haven't didn't go back for the second but I, I saw everyone talking about the third so unfortunately season two is a little bit of a slog but season three is kind of a masterpiece do you need season two for season three you know I think you could probably just get away with it right Okay. Um, I'd say just. Just. Um, it's wonderful, though. Uh, we've started watching This Is America, which I thought, which I think is brilliant. Um, it's Kate Blanchett playing um, a, wo a woman in the early 70s who's trying to stop uh, the Equal Rights Amendment from going through. So she's like the sort of anti feminist enemy of Gloria Steinem and people like that. Right. Uh, it's, that's really wonderful. Um, of course, the last series of Call Saul is really fantastic. I, I, I really loved uh, Unorthodox, the mini series about Hasidic Jews in in Brooklyn. Um, that's on Netflix. Okay. Uh, 
So we've been watching all of them. I'm just starting Better Call Saul. Just started. What? Yeah. From season one. I'm on season one, yeah. I've just I'm about six or seven in. I just did the episode where we get this kind of backstory to Mike Ehrman Trout and it was like, okay, this is fucking good. So obviously you've you've seen all of Breaking Bad, yeah, right? Yeah. Because someone said on Twitter, like, is it okay to watch Better Call Saul before seeing Breaking Bad? And people were replying, yes. But I strongly oppose that point of view. I think you have to watch Breaking Bad before you watch Better Call Saul. Mm. Well, well, I, for no other reason than the fact that the way that Gus is introduced in Breaking Bad is such genius that that's how, you know, the way that Breaking Bad introduces you to Gus is the way that you need to meet Gus. Yeah, not, yeah, yeah. Um, so it's that kind of thing. But um, I think the first couple of seasons of Better Call Saul were, were great, but almost almost self-indulgently slow. But the last couple of seasons uh, are really easily the equal of Breaking Bad, if, if not even better. I think the last okay. two seasons are, you know, when it, when it sort of reaches Breaking Bad land and characters in Breaking Bad start to appear, it's just amazing. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah, we're getting stuck into that. Um, so, yeah, should see us through to the end of the pandemic, yeah. hopefully. Oh, yeah, you're lucky if you're lucky. Older things. Mm. Um, I, I really love Deadwood. Have you ever seen that? Oh, God, yeah. I love Deadwood uh, so much. It's amazing. The, the, the Shakespearean dialogue is just is unbelievable. Um <laughs> Incredible. Can you, cancelling. There's only two times in my life where I felt kind of like, literally like grieving that I've got to the end of a series that was cancelled before it was supposed to be cancelled. Yeah. Um, and, and you just feel outrage yeah. that some television executive made that decision. Did you? And one, go on. Well, one is Edward and the other one is um, Freaks and Geeks. Oh, yeah, Freaks and Geeks. Wow. They were sort of murdered before their time. That's okay, yeah. Did you did you watch the Deadwood movie? Yes. Okay. <laughs> and I, I, I didn't love it. But, you know, the reason why I didn't love it, I think, is because it was it was designed for people who'd watched this, the TV show kind of years ago. Mm. So a lot of it was kind of reintroducing you to the characters and yeah. so on. But we watched the Deadwood movie immediately after watching Deadwood. And so it was kind of redundant for us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. It's brilliant. It really is brilliant. If people haven't seen Deadwood, just download it from wherever. I don't know where it's on. I don't know if it's on Netflix, but, you know, do the download thing and find Deadwood because it's, uh, it's, it's amazing. I love that. Yeah. I think it's HBO, and I think it's HBO and Amazon oh. Prime, and I think it's the way you need to watch it. Okie dokie. All right, well, look, um, stay well and stay safe, and um, good luck with the, the screenplay, and hopefully the new podcast will come together soon, and uh, avoid the Zoom meetings as much as possible. Uh, I've, never, um, I've never done a Zoom call with anyone in my life. You know, it's kind of impressive. It's like it doesn't lag like, you know, Skype often does or FaceTime does. It's mm. kind of it's kind of impressive. Um, how are you handling a, a post football world? Um, I, you know, I'm just sort of taking it day by day, making stuff up as I go. I mean, I'm still writing the blog every single day, so there is some. Sometimes there's some football stuff to talk about. Other times you have to get a little bit creative. But I'm I'm sort of beginning to miss it now because I was you know getting a little bit optimistic about Arsenal again with Mikel Arteta taking over and you know. Mm -hmm. A new handsome manager taking the the team in the right direction. It was all on the up and up, and then you know, only Didn't Arsenal could... it. wasn't our test of it an early COVID. Um, yeah, uh, that, uh, that that's why football got shut down in England was because. Um, yeah, because Arteta got it. Otherwise, they were just going to keep playing the games um, until such time as they, you know, inevitably they would have been told to stop. But they were going to go ahead with the weekend's games and then Arteta got uh, COVID-19 and, you know, the, the the squad couldn't go and play against, I can't remember who it was, whether it was Man City or Brighton or somebody like that. Um, and yeah, you know, if it wasn't for Mikel Arteta and Arsenal, the uh, the COVID nineteen outbreak will be even worse in the UK right now. So there's there's a little trophy for us. Yeah, totally. It's another great uh, Arteta uh, uh, influence on the world. Absolutely, John. Listen, thanks a million. Great to talk to you, and we'll catch up again soon. I hope. Okay, talk to you soon, Andrew.
Thank you very much indeed to John. You can follow him on Twitter at John Ronson, at John Ronson. No doubt many of you know his work already, but if you don't, check out books like The Psychopath Test, So You've Been Publicly Shamed, which is uh, quite prevalent and relevant these days still about how social media reactions can uh, have a huge impact on people's lives inadvertently or not. There's uh, Them, Adventures with Extremists, which is really quite uh, an adventure, as John referenced. The Men Who Stare at Goats, and lots more. John does podcasts, The Butterfly Effect and The Last Days of August, two series which you can download, I'm sure, wherever you get your podcasts. And obviously there are new ones coming, hopefully, when all this COVID-19 business is over. So thank you again to John. And that is where we will leave things for today. Uh, Thank you, as ever, for putting me in your ears. It's much appreciated. Thank you for subscribing. Thanks for being with us week after week after week. Hopefully the podcasts are providing you with some little normality in this uh, strange, unprecedented times, etc., etc. James and I will be here on Monday with an Arscast Extra. We'll have some bonus podcasts for you next week as well. I think we'll be doing some uh, some bits and pieces, so keep an eye out for that. In the meantime, whatever you do or whatever you don't do this weekend, have uh, a good time, have a safe time, a healthy time, and I will catch you on the next one. Until then, cheers, bye-bye. Look, I look at you, not because you give information. I don't know if it's you. I don't know where information comes from. Me? Yeah, why do you look at me? Because it's your press conference. It's not my Okay, story. oh, thank you. I just thought you, you have given this information out. No, I'm looking at you because it's your okay, press conference. Okay, thank you very much.